place that feels like home To the people I can depend on To the faith that's in my bones Take me back to a preacher in a verse Where they've seen me at my worst To the love I had at first Oh, I wanna go to church We look down from a broken sky Traced out by the city lights My world from a mile high Best seat in the house tonight Touch down in the cold black top Hold on for the sudden stop Breathing the familiar shock of confusion and chaos All those people going somewhere Why have I never cared? Give me your eyes for just one second Give me your eyes so I can see Everything that I keep missing Give me your love for humanity Give me your arms for the broken hearted The ones that are far beyond my reach Give me your heart for the ones forgotten Give me your eyes so I can see Yeah 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 Step out on a busy street See a girl in our eyes meet Does her best to smile at me To hide what's underneath There's a man just to her right Black suit and a bright red tie Too ashamed to tell his wife He's out of work, he's buying time All those people going somewhere Why have I never Care. Give me your eyes for just one second Give me your eyes so I can see Everything that I keep missing Give me your love for humanity Give me your arms for the broken hearted The ones that are far beyond my reach Give me your heart for the ones forgotten Give me your eyes so I can see Yeah 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 yeah. I've been here a million times, a couple of million eyes Just moving past me by, I swear I never thought that I was wrong Well I want a second glance, so give me a second chance To see the way you see the people all along Give me your eyes for just one second, give me your eyes so I can see Everything that I keep missing Give me your love for humanity Give me your arms for the broken hearted The ones that are far beyond my reach Give me your heart for the ones forgotten Give me your eyes so I can see Give me your eyes Lord, give me your eyes so I can see Everything that I keep missing Give me your love for humanity Give me your heart Did I say come in? Uh, I think you did, I mean. Mr. Hahn, can I please come in? Yes. So what are we doing today? Sam.
I told you. I get it, okay? Be respectful. I got it. I put my jacket on a thousand times. I took it off a thousand times, okay? This is stupid. I'm done. They can beat me up if they want to. And you know why you only have one student? Because you don't know Kung Fu. So okay. What? Come here. Check it on. Miss Han, I already... Check it on. Check it on. I don't have a jacket Check on. Check it on. Be strong. Check it on. Firm. Check it off. Remember, always strong. Check it off. Strong. Left foot back. Right feet back. Left feet back. Pick up his jacket. Ooh, Focus. Okay. Always concentrate. Left back. Right foot back. Pick up his jacket. Stay. Pick up his jacket. Strong. Hanging up. Hang up. Hang up. And attitude. Strike. Hang up and attitude. Harder. Harder. Hey. Good. But no face. Check it out. <laughs> lives in everything we do, Xiao Zui. He lives in how we put on the jacket, how we take off the jacket. And lives in how we treat people. Everything is Kung Fu. So there's a clip uh, from a movie entitled The Karate Kid. Um, it, 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 the scene that we see there, you know, sort of the, toward the beginning of the movie, uh, the young character, uh, you know, Dre, finds himself and his mom having moved to a new country, obviously a different culture, different people, uh, and he has struggled to find his way uh, in amongst all that stuff. And he's been picked on and been bullied and beat up by uh, a group of about five or six other kids. And so in uh, sort of his attempt to take care of himself and to protect himself, he's turned to Mr. Han, uh, who has agreed to teach him Kung Fu uh, to sort of protect himself. Now, I know the movie is entitled The Karate Kid, Why They Teach Him Kung Fu. That's just how it works out. But it, if they called it Kung Fu Kid, it wouldn't have played off of the original Karate Kid movie way back in the 80s and 90s. So uh, there you go. So anyway, you, the scene that you see there uh, is where you know, Dre's character is, is frustrated by what he feels like is wasting his time. And, and what Mr. Han begins to teach him is he has used something as ordinary and common in life as putting your jacket on the ground and picking your jacket up and putting it on to teach him the basics of what would be the way he's going to protect himself moving forward. 
Earlier in the movie, Mr. Han's character notices that Dre uh, is not only disrespectful to his mother, but disobedient to his mom and that he refuses to pick up his jacket. He walks in the apartment, throws it on the floor, leaves it there, and his mom gets frustrated with him. And Dre, like a lot of kids, shows disrespect to his mom. And so in the clip, you see Dre's character begin to realize that all the things that he's been doing, while he felt like they were ordinary and average and routine, actually was an opportunity for him to be taught something. And in that scene, Mr. Han says, everything that we do is about Kung Fu. It's about putting the jacket on, and it's about how we treat people. That Kung Fu is not just going to be how you protect yourself, but it's going to impact every part of your life. So this morning, we're going to look at a a passage of Scripture that uh, just does a very similar thing. Jesus takes the opportunity to use something that's common and ordinary and routine in the lives of his followers, and he uses that common, ordinary, routine item and thing to teach them something profound about their life as well as about you and me and our life as well. And so for that story, we're going to be in the Gospel of Luke. I share with you frequently uh, that Luke is one of the four Gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Uh, Luke sets out to write an orderly account, as he says, uh, of all the things that happened in Jesus' birth and life and ministry, death and resurrection. Uh, Luke not necessarily being an eyewitness account, but says, I went and interviewed people. I talked to people. I talked to everybody that was there. Um, and everything that I'm writing to you, I believe, is the case. I believe to be true based on all of the people that I have spoken to and how thoroughly Early, I've investigated the matter. And so for this story, we go to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14. We're going to read verse 1, then we're going to skip down and pick up in verse 7, uh, and I'll explain in a minute why we're going to skip those verses in between. So here we go, Luke chapter 14, verse 1. Now one Sabbath, when he, referring to Jesus, when he went to the dine at the house of the ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. Now he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor. And he said to them, when you're invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person. And then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, oh, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. He also said to the man who had invited him, When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor and the crippled and the lame and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. You will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. So lots going on in this story there. Lots happening. Uh, We pick up the story, and and, and let's just jump in right right from the very beginning. Jesus is at the home of the ruler upon invitation and is sharing a meal with the ruler of the Pharisees along with all the other people who are invited. Now, we need to take a second and look at that for a minute. Now, the Pharisees are the group of people who are actually trying to undermine everything that Jesus is doing. And everything that he's saying. The Pharisees are the people that are sort of trying to set him up with questions to trap him in an answer they can use against him to get rid of him. The Pharisees are the group of people that literally are trying to run Jesus out and ultimately toward the end, along with other people, actually have him put to death. I mean, these people are out to get him. And yet Jesus is at the table sharing a meal with the ruler of the Pharisees. Now, let me just ask you a personal thing, just something for you to consider in your own mind. You don't have to answer out loud, but, but it, just envision in your life, okay, in your own life, that there's someone you're in conflict with, someone you've got, been having a problem with, you're at odds with them, they're mad at you, you're mad at them. It's just, it's just it's an ugly situation, and they are literally trying to get rid of you. 
And one day, one magical day comes up and they invite you over to dinner at their house. How likely are you to accept that invitation, knowing that they literally are trying to kill you? I don't know about you, but I'm probably going to be a little skeptical of that invitation because I'm not sure I could trust what actual seasonings might be you know, in the food we're going to eat. I might not be totally sure that when I left that house late at night, there wouldn't be someone. I mean, that, that might not be the place I would immediately want to accept an invitation. Yet Jesus accepts the invitation and is having dinner at the home of the ruler of the Pharisees, the very people trying to get rid of him. Even in the presence of his enemies, there is a table set and he dines in the presence of his enemies, still looking to make a difference in the lives of all who gather. They're sharing a meal, and it is at this table where Jesus takes the opportunity to do something profound and to teach them, because what he does is he addresses two groups of people. He first addresses the people who have been invited uh, and to them, as he sees them show up for the dinner, he notices how they've chosen the places that they're going to sit. Because we all do that when we go to a, a dinner or a banquet or, or a big old gathering with lots of people. I mean, there's this, this the time when you arrive and you look around, you try to figure out, okay, where am I going to go sit? Where do I go sit? Unless, you're, unless your seat has been assigned for you, and sometimes we go to places where that's done. But when it's not, we have that moment of, well, I'm going to decide where to sit. And he noticed that all the people who came to the party, came to the banquet, chose the places of honor to seat as if they just knew that the places of honor were for them. Jesus takes the opportunity to share with them at the table a place where they gather every day, a place that's common, it's ordinary, even routine in their life to teach something profound to them. You see, in our culture and in their culture, it's very similar, that gathering around a table and breaking bread was more than just sharing a meal. It, it had to do with recognizing that you were accepted, that you had a place where you belonged, that there was fellowship taking place, and that beyond just the sort of nourishment of our physical bodies, there was something spiritual that took place. Because you're acknowledging that we are equals and that as we share a meal and we share of our lives, we're literally connecting our lives with the people who are at the table with us. Jesus uses something that's common and ordinary and familiar to teach them things in their life. You know, recently I was asked a question uh, that I'm asked often, um, and it gets asked in a variety of different ways, uh, but in essence, it's kind of the same question. And, and what this person asked me recently, they said, uh, they said, you know, Pastor Bill, you see, you know, you, all, all these stories that you tell about the places where you've been and the things that you've done, the people that you see and all the kids and the youth and your wife and your own kids, I mean, all these things about your grandkids, I mean, all these stories you tell, so how do you have all these experiences? And, and part of what they're also saying is that how does someone your age have all of these experiences in your life. And they go, it's not like in my own life, but I don't have a half of those. How do you have all of these experiences that go on in your life that you share in your messages? And I have, I have two answers. The first answer I give and I gave to him, I said, well, it's real easy. First things first, I make them all up. <laughs> and, and he kind of did like that. He, see, he kind of chuckled and said, what, wait a minute. And I said, no, no, I'm just, just teasing. I don't make them all up. I mean, sometimes I tell stories that are just that. They're stories. But if I tell you, hey, this happened with me and Laura Lee, or this happened with our kids, or this, then it rest assured, it's an actual true story. I said, no, what really is the case is this. I, I do the best I can. Granted, it's not perfect, and I don't get it right all the time. But I, I do the best that I can to literally look at every single thing, every single place with every single body as an opportunity to experience God's presence in my life and to learn what might be taught and learned in that moment. And so everything that takes place, I sort of filter it through that way of looking at it. 
It, when I watch movies, people comment about, how do you find all these movie clips that you use uh, as a way to illustrate things in your messages? And I said, well, when I watch movies, I do the same thing. Every time I'm watching a movie, I'm thinking, okay, how can I use this? Oh, that, that scene will fit sort of this kind of teaching or that, that right there would fit this kind of illustration. I mean, I, you know, I, I recently I did it uh, when uh, Laurel and I went back to the movies recently, uh, actually in theaters, got to go see uh, Top Gun Maverick, uh, which is really, really pretty cool. I haven't seen the first one uh, years and years ago. Uh, and I was sitting there going, ooh, I, when I get my hands on that movie, I was like, that's going to be a clip, and that's a clip, and this will teach this, and I'm, I'm, I can't wait, you know, to get that, you know, my hands on that movie. But it's just, it is just the way that I'm wired. It's the way that I look at everything and everybody all of the time. There are people that will hang out with us, and we do things, you know, you know, personally and socially and that kind of stuff, and there's sort of an expression that's kind of, you know, kind of crept its way into it. It says, hey, be careful when you hang out with Pastor Bill, because anything that you do or say might end up as a sermon illustration. <laughs> so just be forewarned if we hang out or do something, you, you might show up in a message at some point. You just never really know. What I also would say to him and you and anyone else who asked my question is, that's not just the case in my life. If you were to think about your own life, there are tons of things that happen that are ordinary and common and routine that speak to God's presence and are opportunities for you to learn and to share with others what Jesus teaches. Here, let me give you a couple of examples. Let me ask you a question. Where, in, in terms of the sky, where does the sun rise? The, 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 okay, you, you all said that like you weren't really sure of the answer, like there were multiple choices. It, it rises in the east, right? It rises in the east. It sets in the west, and so every morning when you get up, now you may not always see it because it might be cloudy or rainy or it might be wintry, snowy. You might live up north where you don't really see the sun for periods of the time. But every single day, the sun rises in the east and it sets in the west. And it's been that way every day of your life. You have never woken up. I have never woken up and had the sun rise in the north and set in the south. Every single day it rises in the east, and every single night it sets in the west. You know why it does that? Because God created it that way. It's part of God's created pattern order. God created it for the sun's rise in the east, sets in the west. And every single day when you and I get up, and every single day we see the sun rise in the east, and it sets in the west, and we sit and watch either one of those me, I'm more likely to watch the sun set at night than I am to watch it rise in the morning. But whenever you're sitting out doing that, it is a reminder of God's faithfulness and his presence in your life because it is consistent and it is predictable, just like God. We're right now in the summer of the season of summer uh, right now. After summer is going to come fall, and after fall is going to come winter, and after winter comes spring, and the spring comes summer, and it cycles that way every single year, exactly the same way, right? Now, sometimes the summer is hotter than others and longer and shorter, and sometimes the winter is wetter and colder, and sometimes we get in East Texas, we get like one day of fall, <laughs> and sometimes we get like a half a week of spring, it feels like. You know, the, 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 the length of and the severity of may vary greatly from year to year, but we go through the seasons in exactly the same order everywhere. Why is that? God created it that way. It's how God made for it to be. And so when we go through our times of life, our own seasons of life, that we all go through the same seasons, some of them are more severe than others, some of them last longer, some of them are shorter. They vary in intensity and length, but they're in the same order. And it speaks again, to God's faithfulness and God's presence in our life. A couple more. Have you ever had anybody in your life, family, friend, neighbor, coworker, just somebody that you knew, that made decisions and made a series of choices, and when the results of those choices and decisions, the consequences were experienced and lived, did, did you hear things like, well, he had it coming. Well, she got what she deserved. Well, you know, what goes around comes around. You hear my favorite? Well, that's just karma. Anybody ever, ever hear those? Anybody ever say some of those? You, you know, those are wonderful opportunities to teach about what Jesus had to say because all of those in their own way or another are kind of secular versions of what Jesus first taught. 
his followers. And that is we live in a world that is reaping and sowing. That we reap the very things that we sow. So that if you cast out, if you sow anger and hatred, then you're going to reap anger and hatred. But if you were to sow, if you were to cast out mercy and forgiveness and love and graciousness, well, then you're going to reap those very same things. And so rather than saying, well, it's just what he deserved or she got what was coming to her or it was karma or what goes around, comes around. No, no, no. Jesus speaks to that very clearly. And what he speaks to is that you and I have an active participating influence on the things that come in our life. Now, not everything, some things in life just happen the way that they do, but you and I absolutely have a role to play in some of the things that we experience in our life. They're the things that's our personal responsibility, the things that we cast out, the things that we sow, then come back as things that we reap. Oftentimes, also, visit with couples who are getting married, um, who've been married for a while and have a couple bumps in the road and we visit and we talk about a variety of things. And, and, and one of the things I oftentimes do is I, I sit with a couple when they're having some difficulties and I say, okay, well, tell me what's going on and I listen to what she's got to say and, and tell me what's going on I'll listen to what he's got to say. And, and we talk about those things for a few minutes and I say, okay, well, that's really great. I said, but let me, let me ask you a question. Let me, let, me, let me just sort of shift this little dynamic a little bit here. Um, I look at the, the, the wife, the, the, the uh, woman, and I say, okay, how submitted are you to your husband? <laughs> and all the women are going, oh, why you got to start with that one? Why you always got to pick on the wife? Because it gets us to the one that really is important. Because then I didn't turn to the husband and say, how submitted to Jesus are you, husband? Because you remember when Paul wrote, applying what he referred to as the law of Christ, that, that you put other people first. And so in terms of our marriage, Paul writes about, hey, wives, you are to submit to your husbands in as much as your husbands are submitted to Christ. So husband, dad, father, man of the house, how submitted to Jesus are you? Because with us, it sets the tone for our house, our home. It sets the tone for our relationships, for our family unit, with our spouses and our children and even our children's friends. And it sort of takes the shift, the focus off of the things that they're necessarily arguing about and realizing maybe there's something bigger that we haven't really addressed yet. And so let's do that first. And it gives us the opportunity to share. Hey, Jesus said that you're going to know, people are going to know you're my followers, the way you love other people. You just go love everybody the way I've loved you. And because I've loved you in a very sacrificial, others first way, that is what you're to do. You're to go and put everyone else first. And so when it comes to marriages, when it comes to husbands and wives, it should be a race to the bottom. It should be a race to who can submit the most and the fastest. Because that's following the example that Jesus gave us that we are to be servants, not to be served. See, all kinds of opportunities in your life to experience the presence of God and to experience what Jesus taught as well as share what Jesus taught with other people around you. Anybody ever been out to dinner, um, like ever, in a restaurant? You ever had a night where you went out and you're looking forward to the whole night, and, but, but the, the experience just, just, I mean, just wasn't good? I mean, the waiter or the waitress, I mean, they just struggled. I mean, they, you know, they were nice and they were working hard, but, man, they just, they just forgot stuff, may have gotten something wrong, got the ticket wrong. I mean, they just, they just didn't have their A game. They just struggled. And because of their struggle impacted your experience of the dining night out. So here's a question for you. How do you respond to the waiter or to the waitress? Hey, what's your response to that? Do you get mad and you get frustrated and you just let them have it? Or are you gracious and kind, knowing that your night wasn't as good as you wanted it to be, but you're just extra kind instead? When it comes time for the tip, you go, hey, look, I ain't even, no, they didn't earn no tip. They were terrible. My food came out cold. That was wrong. And that, no, I, there's no way I'm tipping them anything. Or do you look at that opportunity as an opportunity to say, 
Let me give a little extra tip. You may sit there going, but Bill, why, I mean, when the night's terrible and they do a horrible job, why would you give an egg? Why would you give a bigger tip than normal? Because it's an opportunity to demonstrate for those at the table who might notice and the waiter or the waitress who is expecting the worst that you can always be extra kind and overly generous. That there's never a situation that doesn't warrant kindness and generosity and forgiveness. Because in my life, probably in yours too, but in my life, I am thankful that God, through his son Jesus, has been overly kind, overly generous, and forgiving in an unlimited, unconditional way. And while it's just a dinner experience at a restaurant, it's just a waiter and a waitress, it's an opportunity in every ordinary life, common experiences, for us to share with others what we've learned and allow others to experience that for themselves. You see, you have opportunities in your life that you might not have been aware of, but this sort of gets, you, gets the ball rolling. You can start thinking about all those ordinary things in your life that take place that you probably haven't noticed because we tend to look for God to act in dramatic and spectacular ways. And while God, God does act in dramatic and spectacular ways, most of the time we experience God in the ordinary and in the common and the routine parts of our lives if we are looking for them. So Jesus at the table looks to everybody after he's seen how they show up. And he says, hey, everybody here who's been invited, he said, all of you who were invited, you have all assumed that you're the most honored person that's here. Well, what happens when there's someone else who's more honored? And and in fact, you don't really get to decide as the one who has been invited who has the most honor. That is reserved for the host to decide who gets the places of honor. Jesus looks at him and says, hey, have some humility. Be a humble person who is here to serve and not be served. And so when you're invited to a banquet, you're invited to a feast, just be thankful and appreciative that you're there and just go and take the lowest spot there. And if the host decides to move you all the way up right next to him at the table, well, then just be thankful for that. But if it doesn't and the host just leaves you where you're seated, be thankful and content that you are there upon invitation and just enjoy the night. You see, Jesus looks at those people and he looks at all of us and says, hey, be humble people. Not people that are looking for ways to be praised but people who are looking for ways to be humble. Then he shifts his attention away from those who've been invited to the one who does the inviting to the host. And and you read the passage, he says, hey, look, don't don't invite the people, that that your neighbors and your friends and your family members and all that, because they will then in turn invite you back. And so then it really just becomes you're only doing for other people because you know they'll do for you. And so there's really kind of a selfish gain in all of that. He says, if you really want to be blessed, if you really want to do something spectacular and dramatic, throw a feast and a banquet and then go invite the lame and the poor and the crippled and the blind. Because none of those people can invite you to a feast or to a banquet. None of those people are going to invite you to their palace. When you invite them to your celebration, you are blessing people who cannot do that for you. And then you'll know what it's like to truly be blessed because you're doing for others simply for the cause of doing for others, not because you're going to gain anything in return. As Jesus shares the parable, and as Luke records, the lame and the blind and the crippled and the poor, are opportunities for Jesus to speak to the subject of this whole encounter. Because the whole encounter, while it takes place, the part that we left out is where Jesus heals someone on the Sabbath, which he has done before. We talked about that last week, which is why we sort of skipped that part. But as he healed someone on the Sabbath, it sort of set the Pharisees up and and all of a sudden become frustrated and angry again. And and they became, what are you doing? You're breaking all the rules. You're breaking all these traditions. Who who do you think you are that you get to heal on the Sabbath? We're We're supposed to not work on the Sabbath day. All these rules and traditions are supposed to follow. And in response to that, Jesus tells these two parables. No, 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 it's about being humble. 
not being arrogant. It's about the kingdom of God recognizing that yours and my status is not what's going to matter. It's our service. It's our service to other people, not our status, not what we've achieved, not what we've accomplished, not what we've acquired, but it is our service, our ability to do for others first that's going to matter most in the kingdom, which is the subject of the parables. And by referring to the lame and the blind and the crippled and the poor, Jesus is saying the kingdom of God is going to be for all Not just the people that you like, that you invited to your feast. Not just your family members that you invited to dinner. Not just your neighbors. Not just the people that you know. Not even just the people that you tolerate and deal with. But even the person that you absolutely cannot stand and despise, and probably that person can't stand and despises you. The person you are most in conflict with. And you don't have to identify their name out loud, but you've probably already got their picture in your head. That person, Jesus would say, is going to be just as welcome in the kingdom of God as you are and as I am. Because the determination as to who's welcome in the kingdom of God is reserved for the host. And when it comes to the kingdom of God, the host is God himself, who throws a feast, prepares a banquet unlike any other you can imagine. And he says, and all are going to be welcome. Not because you say so, not because you say so, not because I say so, but because he says so. While Jesus is at the table, he lets them all know, hey, you aren't going to be the ones who decides who gets to come. And thankfully so, frankly. Because if truth be told, all of us at times in our life have looked at people and thought about people in our lives and we thought to ourselves, I don't really know. I mean, they're... I'm not, they may not make it into heaven. I'm not so sure. They're kind of walking on a fine line. They're on the edge. They're not a surefire trip to heaven when the time comes. I don't know how they're going to make it or not. And at times we sort of presume to go, oh, there's no way that person's going to be there and that person's not going to be there. And Jesus would say, that's not my role. <laughs> that's not your role. That's the Father's role. And we all should be thankful for that. Because while there are times where we may look at other people and sort of deem them maybe not really worthy to be in the kingdom of God, the flip side would also exist. There'd be somebody who'd look at me and somebody who'd look at you and go, yeah, they're not worthy either. It is to all of our benefits that we are not the hosts and therefore we are not the ones who says who's welcome. The host who sets the place who sends invitations and says all come is the Father himself. So may you and I be people who literally look at every single day, every single place we go, every person that we come into contact with, every situation that unfolds to the best of our abilities, look at everything that takes place as an opportunity to experience God's presence in our life and opportunities for us to learn and experience what Jesus has taught and then share those things with others as well. And may we be people who look at everybody that we see, no matter where we go, no matter who they are, no matter what they've done, may we be people in the spirit of this story and this parable, look at everybody that we've seen, and we see them as a person who is welcomed in the presence of God, in the kingdom of God. And may that truth impact the way that we then treat them. Amen. I love you, Lord Oh, your mercy never fails me And all my days I've been held in your head From the moment that I wake up 
Till I lay my head Oh, I will see Of the goodness of God Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. 
Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we have fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you and your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. When he gave him thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, do this for the remembrance of me. Take these gifts, O Lord, and sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in Him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ keep you in everlasting life. Will you please join me in our unison prayer? Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food and the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Like a river attendeth my way When sorrows like sea billows roll Whatever my lot you have taught me to say my soul it is well it is well with my soul 
Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. My sin. Of this glorious thought My sin not in part but the whole Is nailed to the cross And I bear it no more Praise the Lord, praise the Lord O oh my soul It is well my soul it is well it is well with my soul it is well it is well with my soul and Lord haste the day when my faith shall be sighed, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll, the trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend, even so it is well with my soul. With my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul.